Hi everyone, I'm Dale Smith, aka Journo Dale, and we're here to talk about Canadian politics. It's time to take some viewer questions, and we are going to start off today with David, who uh, asks us over the Patreon, uh, what's your opinion on how effective minority governments are in terms of passing meaningful legislation? We're hearing lots of takes from pundits who are trying to ease some people's frustration about the Liberal win by arguing that a lot of great bills or programs came out of minority governments, but are those days gone? All right, so a couple of things here. Um, first of all is that the efficacy of minority parliaments are very much context dependent. It depends on kind of the mood of the electorate and how strong the minority can, uh, is. Uh, we saw, for example, in the Stephen Harper minorities, um, a lot of frustration because um, there wasn't a chance for a lot of his program to get through. The opposition was very much trying to keep him on the ropes. And so uh, we didn't see too many um, major changes. And on the other hand, the changes we did see were largely stuffed into omnibus bills because it was easier to pass them that way. Uh, it could all be done in one fell swoop, uh, so to speak. And uh, it was, you know, all one measure is a confidence vote because it was generally in a budget related bill. And that would kind of play a bit of chicken with the opposition in, uh, in terms of, do you really want us to defeat us over this? Um, so that's one of the things that might happen. I know we talk a lot about, you know, look at all the great things that happened in the 50s during the minorities uh, there, or 50s and 60s. Um, but we also need to remember that that was a time of tremendous social upheaval and, you know, the expansion of the welfare state across the Western world. Um, we're not in that kind of a situation right now. So I don't know that we can really say, oh, you know, uh, Medicare uh, came in during the, you know, during the minority periods of, of uh, Pearson and Diefenbaker and therefore, you know, we should expect something similar to happen here. And people even going so far as to say, hey, maybe Pharmacare is going to be that unifying issue. I don't know that that's necessarily going to be the case. However, um, it's possible, but it's, it's not something we can take for granted in that regard. We have another question from Patreon, this time from Martin, who asks, a uh, question about equalization. If Alberta introduced a sales tax, would it, that reduce its entitlement to equalization under the current formula? If so, uh, does that in any way add to the reluctance to introduce a sales tax in Alberta? Um, this is part of the confusion that comes around with the way in which we talk about equalization in this country. Um, we. People seem to think that it has to do with a, a province's balance sheet. And, you know, if they're running a deficit, therefore they must be eligible for equalization. If they're running a surplus, they must not be. And that's not really how the program works. Um, the program deal or is about fiscal capacity, uh, which means how are you able to deliver an equal amount of service to other uh, provinces uh, using the resources you have available, and that can include what your tax rates are. Mm. Alberta, having no sales tax and, you know, still a great deal of fiscal capacity, uh, would not really be affected if they did introduce a sales tax to get rid of their budget deficit. Um, remember that it's also the province itself that's not paying equalization, it's individual Canadians. It comes out of our income taxes to the federal treasury and it's the federal government who then redistributes a portion of that to provinces who need it uh, in order to deliver services. Um, and Albertans pay more because they have the highest incomes in the country. Um, by far the highest incomes in the country. And that's why, you know, you if you aggregate that, you say Albertans pay more in equalization than they get in return. But that simply is a fact of they have the highest incomes, therefore they pay more income tax. That's all that that really means. And politicians will tend to spin that in order to create a sense of grievance around equalization. Um, so income tax, sorry, if, Alberta introduced a sales tax, it wouldn't actually affect that 
in any real way. We have a question here from Twitter from Nikki, who asks, how did the Canadian media contribute to the negativity of this election campaign and what can they do moving forward to prevent it? It's a complex question and I think a lot of it has to do with the very leadership focused way in which we really reduced election coverage. Um, because of that, a lot of the coverage was about kind of the attacks being made against the leaders from their opposite sides. Um, and when that personal kind of focus keeps being put on the leaders, I think that helps contribute to the tone of the negativity. Whereas if we'd stuck to more policy questions, um, platform issues, uh, things where we could get a lot more um, outside perspective on what it was the, the parties were offering, I think that would change the tone significantly, but that's not the way in which we've been covering these, these elections. So that's kind of my read of the situation. Um, it's also, I think, the fact that uh, media outlets were very much looking for some kind of a, a sexy hook um, for there to be the election on. And, you know, they kept saying, well, this is an election about nothing because they couldn't find what that sexy enough hook was going to be, even though there were some really fundamental questions that were being asked uh, by the parties and um, kind of fundamental issues that were being put forward in terms of the solutions that they were offering. But we never really got to that discussion based on the way in which we were focusing on the coverage, which was again, mostly leader centric. And I think that's what we kind of need to take away from, uh, from the coverage we saw in this election. I have another question here from Twitter from Bob who asks, can Andrew Scheer survive as the leader of the Conservative Party? Short answer is yes. Um, he can tell the party, and he has been trying to tell the party in the last few days, that look at the increased seat count we've got, we've made gains um, in parts of the country, we won the popular vote, which is not a real thing, um, but he's trying to make it a thing in order to justify the kind of results that they got. Um, so if he can convince enough party members of that, he could conceivably stay on. Um, there will be a, a leadership review um, in April. And so he has until that long to basically tell the party that, you know, these are the gains we made, you know, we're in a strong position. Um, and, and therefore, you know, uh, I should be allowed to um, go to another election. That being said, I think uh, there are certain members of the party and certainly members of the media who can point to some personal ways in which Scheer kind of failed in the election in terms of um, ways in which he wasn't able to address concerns about himself, his beliefs, his... Um, even his own, you know, biography that he just kind of blustered through and never really addressed. Uh, and I think that left a lot of the public kind of feeling cold about what the prospects were. And so um, if party members, and this is a grassroots process ostensibly in uh, that party, if, if those uh, card-carrying conservatives um, don't feel that he is necessarily taking the right lessons from the election defeat, then they may decide uh, they need someone who is going to be able to um, take those kinds of lessons and, and, you know, learn from their mistakes and do better in the next election. And I don't know that we've seen enough of that humility from Sheer just yet, so that could affect how his party sees things. I've got another question here from Patricia who asks, what's it gonna be like for Jody Wilson-Raybould as the only independent? Um, the short answer is uh, that it's probably gonna be pretty lonely for her because she's got um, no real um, natural allies in the house in terms of who she's going to be um, aligning herself with. She says she's going to be um, voting with the Liberals on most things, um, which is fair enough, but she's kind of alienated herself from the party membership. Um, and that, I think, is going to make it dif more difficult for her to, 
you know, just basically be an MP in, in Ottawa. Um, Ottawa can be a pretty lonely place if you don't have enough of a, a team and support network around you, um, which a lot of caucuses provide. Um, and seeing as we are in an era where we don't have a lot of, you know, time where MPs get together and uh, socialize the way they used to when they would have dinner three nights a week and then evening sittings, um, that makes that kind of relationship building much more difficult. And when you, she's in a position where she's strained those existing relationships, that will be even more difficult. When it comes to doing work in the House of Commons, um, she will get a question in question period um, maybe once every two or three weeks. So she will have that visibility and exposure, but she will really not be able to participate in committees unless she can convince uh, one of the other committee members to give her a slot to ask questions uh, on specific files or issues. Um, that again it involves the kind of relationship she's going to build with, it's likely gonna to have to be the NDP or the Bloc or even the Conservatives, um, which, I mean, depending on what the issue is, they may not necessarily want to give her the airtime or attention on that. Um, as well, it's largely just going to be, you know, procedurally, she can show up to the House of Commons and try and get in on what debates she can. Um, but that's ultimately going to be up to her as to how much she wants to participate in the process. Um, not every MP is Elizabeth May in terms of trying to, you know, be there for absolutely everything. Um, so we'll see how much she uh, decides she wants to put into it in that regard. Um, and, uh, and what kind of contribution she thinks she can make um, in that capacity as an independent. Um, and, you know, this may be a minority, but there is no kingmaker position for anyone in this uh, particular configuration. So I think that also kind of marginalizes her a little more, and we'll see what she does with it. And that's everything for this week. Join us again next week for some more Canadian politics. I'm Dale Smith, that's at journo underscore Dale on Twitter. And don't forget to like the video, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. Thanks everyone.